action. This is katuk. We often call it kaput because it kind of looks like that. It's a leaf vegetable that comes from the lowland rainforest of Borneo. And it's the only euphorb that I've ever heard of that people eat the leaves raw. So, for anyone who wants to try some, we have had this before. You haven't had it or she's had it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't believe so. Good. Yeah? And doesn't it have these little flowers on it too? It does have these little flowers. Ours, you can see this, there's one, one of them over here. Ours never Well, I got a fruits. good shot of it. Okay, got it? Pretty decent. There's some, some more little open ones here. It's a fruit? They make a fruit, and I think you can eat the fruit, but ours never have because this one's it's got some, some petals on. You can see that. Ours never fruit because we only ever got one individual, and they require cross pollination for fruiting. So these so that are means that means that they need to have another another one or another kind. It needs to have a genetically distinct individual to cross pollinate with. We take cuttings, and a lot of people are always asking me. If I have two clones, can they cross-pollinate? No, because it's still the same plant, just in two spots. You know? So it's, it's like, kind of like inbreeding. It's, it's, it's a, it's You're a trying to inbreed. It's a, it's a way the plant has <laughs> developed to prevent inbreeding in order to get more genetic diversity in its offspring. Uh, you know, asking if, if, if two clones, if two different trees that are the same variety can cross-pollinate with each other is sort of like expecting two branches on the same tree to cross-pollinate with each other, and of course they know that they're the same, so they're not going to do that. Hmm. Some, some plants will self, some plants are self-fertile, some plants are not. This one is one that's not. Um, so these are some cuttings that I collected from some of our plants growing in the nursery to make more of them. And we're going to cut these up and put them in the rooting medium. And so um, where did you get these actually and what are some of the benefits because we are the edible plant project so um, why is it that uh, we're growing this one? I think this came from Echo. and I Just kind of like us but they're down in Fort Myers, Naples area and they're faith based but they're, uh, they're kind of like us right they have an edible nursery for outreach and such. They, they do a lot of missionary work in tropical areas, third world countries and they help people by sharing seeds and plants and ideas. They try to make subsistence agriculture a little bit more effective. Which is uh, a lot of what we also do, and uh, they've helped us. We've gotten a lot of our, our a lot of plants from them, originally, uh, directly or indirectly. And um, so why is it that you're uh, trimming all the leaves off? Well, as you can notice, this little twig does not have very many roots. Like and none. <laughs> exactly. Now, if, if I were to just go stick a branch out in the ground, it's just going to dry up and die. Anybody who's done that knows that's what happens. But if you cut off most of the leaves, it, there's a lot less area for it to lose water from, and it's less likely to dry up. And we put it in a plastic bag also. We put it in some some good reading medium. Yeah, we have another we have another section of another video on that too. Yeah. To cover it. And uh, and that helps maintain the high humidity to keep the cutting from drying up until it can grow roots and be able to provide water for itself. So do you have any tips uh, besides I guess just general tips on uh, how to take a, a branch like this and uh, make cuttings, because when you were doing the uh, Pacific spinach, I, I missed this part uh, on the footage. Because um, I'll probably splice this in uh, with the other ones. Well, basically, you usually want to avoid the very tender tips, although sometimes the tips are the parts that work best. Uh, but this one's looking very tender, so I'm going to clip that off. Uh, you may want to leave a few, a few leaves on so that it's able to photosynthesize at least a little bit while it's trying to grow roots, but you want to still keep it in the shade so that it doesn't have to deal with intense solar heat. Then we put it in there. We want to cut them about six to eight inches for most things. And we put them in a pot all together so that we can put a bag over it, keep the humidity up. Not all of these are going to take. Some of them are going to die. And that, this is a way that we can sort them out and use, better, use our, our resources more efficiently. We could put each pot each, each cutting in its own pot with its own bag and its own string but then 
we would be having some difficulty because the rooting medium is not well fertilized. Well fertilized soil is not good for growing roots into. So if we just did each one in its own pot and and uh, had to then we have and, and use rooting medium we would have to add fertilizer on top of that and since we don't have really an organic granular fertilizer we can just throw in what we like to do is use horse manure and and uh, a lot of other things that we mix in to provide fertility uh, it really works better for us to get it rooted in the rooting medium and then take it out and transplant it once it's grown some roots into fertile soil and then it can then it can take off Right. So, uh, do you have any other tips? Because I noticed that you uh, had cut some that are green, and uh, so some plants like uh, like yucca, cassava, for instance, um, you would cut the woody ones. But I noticed that mm -hmm. we're doing the green ones. So I guess in this particular plant, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, I'm assuming. I guess you just need to experiment a little bit. Some things like cuttings closer to the tips, and th some things like the big thick branches at the bottom. Most things do better from cuttings near the tips, but yucca and what's the other one I was thinking of? Moringa. And they probably chaya to, too? Chaya, yeah, chaya probably also. They seem to like the, the big thick parts at the bottom. So do you have any um, suggestions on how to eat or how to cook uh, the katuk? Cook the katuk. I, I mean, you can eat it raw, obviously, and yeah. it's pretty tasty. It's got a good, good mild taste to it. You throw it in a salad. It's a little bit tougher than I like for salad greens, but it, it is saladable. Yeah. Supposedly, you can you can cook it. I don't have any recipes for it. I don't really eat this much. I've heard that it's called a, a tropical asparagus in places where it's grown, and that if you fertilize it heavily, it can grow real thick succulent tips that are actually somewhat like asparagus, although it's not at all related. Uh, it doesn't grow that well here. So maybe yeah. you have to go to Borneo to get your tropical asparagus. So so one of the things is uh, to communicate to people that uh, something is edible. Um, there are things that are not related to the actual name at all. I mean, Michael is well known. He uses the Latin names uh, very frequently. However, um, you know, it's much easier to call things, um, here, I'm going to flip this over, so you see, well, I can't, anyway, so, if you, like, you know, right, so, if we call things like Pacific spinach, Okinawa spinach, the spinach tree, it's just, like, for, for wording, you know, to communicate to people, hey, you can eat that, or it's just easier to pronounce to people who don't use Latin words, or never heard of it, it's completely new to them, um, you know, just to, to communicate to them, hey, this is something that you can eat. And it just kind of conveys a different level of comfort and familiarity uh, in our language, especially people who are new to the whole concept of uh, edible plants outside of, you know, a typical garden and what's that you find at Publix. Right? Yep. So, so if you're wondering, those aren't every, we don't have a million different crazy varieties of spinach, it's just, <laughs> they're, they're called these things often to communicate edibility. The funny thing is, we have a lot of things that actually are close relatives of spinach and actually taste like spinach, and yet they're not called spinach. <laughs> have all these things that are nothing like spinach at all, and they're called spinach. Okay, so what, what do you think would be an example of something like that is related to spinach that isn't called it? Tellaloo, and all the amaranths. Close relatives of spinach, taste like spinach. You can cook them like spinach or eat, um, probably don't want to eat them raw, but use them in any cooked spinach recipe and they're a real good substitute. But nobody ever calls Kalaloo spinach. <laughs> <laughs> and they call a lot of other things Kalaloo, ironically, too. Yeah, that, that's another confusing part. <laughs> so that's why the Latin words are the best, just, you know, if you're into that, um, that is one of the best things to do if you want to get into edible plants. Um, gives you a better idea of um, you know, the, the, the true names of it so you don't get confused. Because colloquially, things can have uh, the same name but be totally different. Um, or you'll have the same plant but it has like ten different names across the world. So. And I guess
guess tropical spinach, or I'm sorry, trop tropical asparagus sounds a little bit more appealing than katuk or sauropus androgynus. What was the name again? Sourpuss? So sauropus. Oh. <laughs> Almost sourpuss, but not quite. Well, it's not sour though, so it tastes good. Yeah.